Good morning. Good morning. There are live people in front of me. And I want to say that because it has been 20 weeks since I have stood uh, and maybe even done a lesson. A lot of my lessons have been done from the church office, as you have seen, uh, for the adults. And today kind of kicks that off up here. If you open your Bibles today to Exodus chapter 1 and 2, Exodus chapter 1 and 2, I'll go ahead and tell you today is a little bit odd. Um, just now, I was thinking, I've got to look up and look at people, not a camera. Uh, and some of you are going to give me reactions, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I think back to the last time that I spoke in this room was about 20 weeks ago. And on that Sunday, I talked about Jesus and about walking on the water. And I had a slide behind me um, on that Sunday that showed some of the things that had happened that week. And that was the first time we'd really heard about COVID. Uh, the stock market had kind of had a little hiccup that week. Uh, there had been a tornado come through Nashville. Um, and that was 20 weeks ago. And so to stand here today before you um, is amazing. I am excited. I hope you can hear that in my voice. Those of you who can only hear my voice, and if you can see it on my face, there is a smile. Uh, I put a handout. I thought that made things a little more normal. Uh, some of you got a handout there in the parking lot or, or other places, and I hope you'll follow along. It's in yellow, uh, and that you'll be with us. My lesson today is entitled, Moses, the Original Basket Case. And maybe you've heard that phrase before. Somebody was a basket. That person's a basket case. Well, I'm not sure I really knew where that came from. And so I decided to do some research and found out that it actually had a very serious meaning. For someone to have been a basket case is a term that comes from World War I. And it comes from World War I and meant someone who had lost their arms and their legs in battle and literally were now being carried around in a basket. They, they had no way to get around. They had no control of their body in the sense that you and I did today, walking in here and coming in here and driving here. And so they were often called a basket case. And so it, it has a very kind of somber and deep meaning. Today, we tend to think about it as someone who's struggling, maybe emotionally, uh, maybe physically, uh, maybe just some other things psychologically going on. But I wanted to talk about Moses today. And that's what our adult Bible study is going to be on uh, for the next few weeks. I uh, hope you'll continue to tune into our YouTube channel and follow that. But today, I wanted to start us off as a group on that. Someone once said that change is the only constant. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. Change is the only constant. When we think of constant, we think of things that don't change. But change happens. And in Exodus chapter 1, we see a great change. We see a great change from Joseph, who, who was well known in Egypt, to several hundred years where the Israelites now, their importance had been forgotten. Join me, if you will, there in those first passages. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. I don't know if you remember when Jacob brought his family. He brought his 12 sons. He brought other parts of it. Seventy people showed up. Seventy people showed up in Egypt. And Joseph found them jobs and fed them even after all they had been through. And when they will leave, 400 years later. Yeah, they're in Egypt for 400 years. Between the end of Genesis and really Exodus is almost 400 years. We think there's over a million people related to these families that will live. Wow, what a change in 400 years. Well, these folks had come down. And if you look at verse 7, it lets you know. Let's go back into verse 5. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was already. And Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. There was change. There was change. People had passed away. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. What did I tell you? In 400 years, it would be a million of them. And grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. And it was so filled with them that the Egyptians became afraid of them. And you know what? Circumstances. Circumstances are often out of our control. And a lot of you have struggled with that. I'm going to tell you, I don't think it's a surprise to a lot of you who know me here. I'm a little bit of a control freak. Ask my wife. I kind of like things the same way every day. I eat the same thing for breakfast every day. And if we run out of that thing for breakfast, oh my, it's just a bad day, right? Any of you have that same kind of thing? There are things that are out of our control. And I think one of the things that we've struggled with as people is we have not been in control of this thing. 
that we have called Corona or COVID or the shutdown or whatever word you want to put with it. And that has been hard. And I want you to see here in Exodus, there are some circumstances that are out of their control. Look at verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It has been several hundred years. You know, we would like to think that in a hundred year history of a country, you would remember everything and everybody. But we don't remember everything and everybody. I often have my students say, do you know who your dad is? And well, yeah, they know who do you know who his dad is? Yeah, they know, do you know who his dad is? And, and, and the hands kind of start going down a little bit. I say, do you know who his dad is? And what I have learned that within about four generations, you disappear. People don't know who you are anymore. Unless someone studies their genealogy or goes to a family cemetery, we pretty much stop existing. For a lot of people. And so a king rises up that doesn't know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Those folks are growing and, and, and they're there in the land of Goshen and they're using all of our resources and they're becoming a big people inside of us. And they're not really Egyptians. I mean, that's what he's saying in that sentence. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply and it happen in the event of a war that they join our enemies and fight against us and go up out of the land. Pharaoh is concerned that the children of Israel are not real Egyptians. Now they have lived there 300 plus years, but they're not Egyptian enough for Pharaoh. And he's scared that they might rise up and try to overthrow Verse 11, therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Did you see that? Growth can come from affliction. Did you hear that? Growth can come from affliction. Have any of you grown in this time? You know, those first few Sundays that we were separated, for the first time, some of you had to figure out how to worship on your own. You had to read the Bible for yourself. You had to sing a song for yourself. Some of you have been preparing communion for yourself. Growth can come out of affliction. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. They were harder on them. The more they grew, the harder the Egyptians were. Has Satan been after you lately? The more you have grown in this, and you have. You, you may not have even seen it or recognized it. But guys, if we come together, we're going to see growth in people. And you don't think Satan is scared about that? So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in this field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Here were these outsiders, these strangers, who had come into their land, and the Egyptians were being hard on them. I often wonder how we treat people who don't fit our model of what it means to be, and you can answer the blank. What about those that, that we say, well, well you know, my, my version of Christianity is this. And sometimes it's a very narrow view for some of us. Or, or my view of citizenship is, is this, and that's a very narrow view, view. I want you to see that what happened to these people was what started with use and abuse ended in violence. Because they were the outsiders. You know, Jesus often ministered to the outsiders. Do you notice that in his ministry? He doesn't just minister to Jews. He ministers to a Samaritan woman. Do you remember the story at the well? Do you remember he goes other places? He even says, it's for the Jews, it's for the Samaritans, it's for the Gentiles. He was expanding the idea of who God was with and God was behind. But what had started with use and abuse with these folks ended in violence towards them. And I wonder if maybe we are that way sometimes. It's very easy for us to stereotype a people, isn't it? 
somebody that's different than me, somebody that looks different than me, that thinks different than me, that lives different than me, and we can give them a nickname, and before long, the nickname becomes abuse, and the abuse can become violence, and we stand on the side and don't even recognize it. And you know, in a time of crisis, there's often a call for courage. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shepara and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife, when you birth children, that, that's your job, for the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God. Do you see that in your passage? The midwives did not say, woo, Pharaoh gave us an order. We better listen to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is telling us to kill children, so it must be okay if the government says that. No, they feared God. And they knew that life was precious. And they knew that God's people's lives were precious. Are God's people's life precious? Who are you missing in this? You know, I know we're spread out over four different locations today. Let me go ahead and tell you, for those of you who don't know, normally on campus here, on this hill, the hillside, we're usually having somewhere around 130, 150 people worshiping. Did you know that? Now, I know where you're looking today, you say, well, I can only see 30, or I can only see 40, or I can see a lot of cars, but I don't know who's in them. We're, we're having about 150 people show up on this hillside. But we also have about 70 families who are worshiping by video, by worship video. Every week, I kind of look at those numbers, who's watching those, and we have a consistent 70 times that those things are watched. But who are we missing here? But it says they feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. You know, I would like to know more about these women. These are two people in the Bible that I don't know a lot about. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about them. I don't know that there's ever been a ladies day about them. How about it, ladies? You ever been to a ladies day where it's these two ladies that you talk about how they stood up to an order and they said, you know what? We're going to follow God. We're going to follow God on this. Who did they fear? They feared God, not their culture. And if you're following along on the sheet, there's some blanks there and there's a lot of M's in those blanks. And let me tell you what ought to go there. In a time of murder and mayhem. In a time of murder and mayhem, these midwives were on a mission. Guys, are you in a time of mayhem? Are we in a time of chaos? Are we in a time of confusion? Are you on a mission? These ladies were on a mission. Yeah, in a time of murder and mayhem, they still knew they had a mission. And what was their mission? Not to get caught up in national issues, but instead needs of neighbors. Did you hear that? Not to get caught up in the national issues, but the needs of neighbors. Are we caught up in the needs of neighbors? Are there those of you who can hear me right now who have a need? Please don't leave today if you have a need. If your family is struggling financially, if your family is struggling with food, if you're just struggling because of loneliness, you spend the whole week by yourself, and this is the one time you get to see people, and you just want to talk to somebody for a little longer today, will you say it? Will you be honest with us and let us know what your need is? What is the need of our neighborhood here on this field? You see, we're changing people's lives not because they were people of power, but because they were people of God. These midwives had more impact on the daily life of those pregnant women than Pharaoh ever would. And so I wonder today if there are people who are somewhere in the world worshiping today because they fear God more than their culture. Stephen has been very good to let us remind ourselves of the persecution. You know, I don't feel persecuted this morning to be here. I don't expect the government to walk in and say, hey, you guys clear out. You're not allowed to worship God. Turn your Bibles in. Don't you ever show up here again. We didn't have to whisper in our singing today because we were afraid the neighbors might hear us. But somewhere in the world today, there's a group of Christians who are meeting and they worship in whisper. How did you sing today? Those of you in your car, are you singing with us today? Those of you in the pavilion, are you singing with us today? Those in the fellowship, are you singing with us today? I know we're singing it here. And I appreciate those men who have continued to lead us in those songs. Go to verse 18. 
So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. They say, Hey, these Hebrew women, man, they're strong. Those babies come out before we can even get there half the time. Now again, I don't know a lot about birth and babies. Let me just go ahead and tell you, this is not a part of the lesson that I am an expert on. And I hope you are smiling where you are hearing that. But these Hebrew women, they said, you know what? Those babies already are there, and by the time they're there, you know, we, we can't kill them then. Look at verse 20. Therefore God dwelt well with the midwives. Guys, who do you want to deal well with you? The government or your God? And these ladies, it was more important to please their God. And the people multiplied and grew mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. He took care of his people. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born to you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Pharaoh wants the boys dead. Why? Because they grew up to become warriors. They, they grow up to, to fight against the Egyptians. Why keep daughters alive? Because you can intermarry them among the Egyptians, and they can have half Egyptian children, and eventually they'll be a part of their society. Now remember, the Israelites had been there 300 years. Were they not already part of their society? And then a cradle and a cry changed it all. Are you with me in Exodus 2? Are you with me in Exodus 2? And a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. What was her job? To kill it. Her job was to kill that male child. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, I love that part of the verse. Are you with me? Are you with me in the scripture? And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, there are two things about me that make that about that phrase that make me laugh. Number one. Has anybody ever told you that's an ugly baby? I mean, when you come out with a mid-shaped, misshapen head and covered in gelatinous material, everyone still says what? <gasps> what a beautiful baby. Right? I remember there's an episode of Seinfeld where there's a couple that has an ugly baby. But you know what everybody tells them? That's a beautiful baby. Guys, sometimes we're probably not real beautiful at birth, but with somebody you are. It always makes me laugh. The second thing is, you know who wrote Exodus? Moses. Moses was inspired by God to call himself as a baby. What? Beautiful. You know, if you look at my baby pictures, I'm more lumpy than beautiful. Let, let me be honest with you, all right? I'm more lumpy than beautiful. I'm more like the Michelin tire kid, right? I don't know that I'm a beautiful baby, but I'm sure to my parents I was a beautiful baby. I'm sure to my grandparents, I was a beautiful baby. You know, one of the things that I didn't realize how much I missed was until a few weeks ago. I was in the fellowship hall, and we were singing, and I heard children. You know, that's something I didn't realize I missed. As much as I've been a teacher, as much as I've not been able to be with kids, a few weeks ago in the fellowship hall, there was a family down there, and I went to them after service, and I said, you know what? Can I tell you what I loved about service today? You know, I can't wait that we come back in this room together. And you know what? Some of those children have not been in this room in a long time. Some of us adults have not been in this room in a long time. And we're going to struggle, right? We're, we're going to struggle with the new routine of being back in here. And those kids are too, and that's going to be okay. I've never been a minister that was upset by the sound of children in the audience. Now, I have competed with them before. <laughs> I remember many a sermon where the louder I got, the louder the child got, and the quieter I got, the quieter the child got. One of my favorite stories in competition with the child was on an Easter Sunday when I was preaching at the Vesta Church. And a young girl had gotten something in an Easter basket that morning, and she had brought it to church with her. It, it, was, it was a duck. It was, a, it was a, a toy duck, not a real duck. That would been interesting too, right? It was a toy duck. And she had played with that duck all during service. I could see her sitting right over there. She loved this new little toy she had gotten. And she played with it. No big deal. And it came time for communion. And you know what happens in communion, right? The whole room is quiet. And I remember the prayer had just been said. And the bread was being passed. 
And somehow she had not noticed in all that time that morning and during the service that that duck had a button on it. And she touched that button. And in the middle of communion came, here comes Peter Cottontail, except in quacking. Quack, 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 quack. And you know what we did? We laughed. We were in communion together in a different way because of the child. And that's not to, to do away with, I don't understand what communion is and the seriousness of it, but we were together because of the child. I can't wait till we come together and, and the children are back with us. What does this mother do? She hides him for three months, and when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrush. She made a box. You know, when you think of Ark and Noah, but she just makes a box. And you notice what she makes the box with? Uh, bull rushes and then does what? Puts asphalt and pitch on the outside. It sounds a lot like another Ark that we read about earlier. And put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. I can't imagine what that was like for that mother. Number one, she was following the letter of the law. What did the letter of the law say? If you have a son, what? Put him in the river. <laughs> and so she said, all right, I will. And for three months, she hid that child. Some of you have been alone with your children in the house for three months. You kind of wish your child would hide, maybe at this point. I don't know what that's like. Some of you have been with the same people for a long time. She puts that child in a box, in a river, in faith. I wonder what we need to put in a box before God in faith. Today, if I ask all of you to write down something that you're struggling with, something that, that you're dealing with, something that you're praying about, I said, write down, we're going to put it in a box. And in faith, we're just going to go over here to the boat ramp and let it go in the river, and we're going to see what happens to it. That was the faith of a family. Now, notice the mother stations the sister, verse 4, not too far off, so she can see what happens. And she doesn't just put the child anywhere. She puts the child where it's probably going to be discovered. But it's going to be discovered by an Egyptian. Not, not a Hebrew, but by an Egyptian. And the Egyptians didn't like the Hebrews. I also want to remind you of this. Are you with me still, church? Moses was not born in a perfect time. Did you hear that? I need to make sure you hear that. If you heard nothing else, Moses was not born at the perfect time. He was born into a time where people hated the Hebrews. He was born into a time where the Hebrews were slaves. He was born into a time where the Hebrews were abused. He was born into a time when the Hebrews were killed. Guys, there is no perfect time. But God would use that baby born in those times to change his people. The daughter of Pharaoh, verse 5, comes down to bathe in the river of her and her maidens, and they notice the box. And they bring it out of the water and she opens it and she sees the child. And she recognizes that, that it's a Hebrew child. I want you to look at verse 6. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby wept. The baby cried. I don't yearn for the day that our kids are back in this room and, and they can hear our songs and we can hear their tears sometimes. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Boy, I love that. I don't know if any of you ladies have ever noticed what exactly happened there in the story. But what happened there in the story was Moses' mother, his actual birth mother, was going to become his nursemaid. And ladies, are you ready for this? She got paid. <laughs> She got paid to raise her own child. You talk about a ladies' day. There are at least three women in this story that we probably, you know, we often think of strong male characters in the Bible. There are some fantastic, fantastic strong female characters in the Bible. Her name will be Jochebed. We don't meet her name until Exodus 6. We don't know her name until much later in the story. But she's going to be paid to take care of her child. Look at verse 10. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And that had to be hard. So she called him Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. You know that's what Moses means. You knew some Hebrew and didn't even know it, did you? Moses means drawn out of the water. Next time one of you fishermen are out there on a boat, 
you cast your line and you get a fish and it jumps up out of the water, you know what you can say? Moses! Right? I drew it out of the water. What are we having for dinner tonight, honey? Moses. <laughs> what I drew out of the water. What is it God is drawing you out of in these times? What is it God is drawing you out of in these times? What would be your name in these times? Would it be fearful? Would it be scared? Would it be uncertain? Yeah, possibly. Guys, I have run the gamut of emotions on this thing too. And I continue every day when I get an email about school opening or not opening. When I see a news story, when I see numbers, I have the same emotional roller coaster you have. Can I just be honest with you? But you know what else I also have? I have the same God that Moses had. And I had the same God that you have. That baby in the basket had no idea what God had planned for him. No idea. Guys, you ever think God may have a plan in this that we can't even imagine because we're in it? You know, when that baby was in the basket, it did not say, one day I'm going to cross the Red Sea. When that baby was in a basket, it didn't say, I'm going to be a shepherd. When that baby was in a basket, it didn't say, I'm going to lead a million people. When that baby was in a basket, it didn't know anything. Full faith in God. And that kid was going to go from Hebrew to hieroglyphics. Are you with me in the lesson? He was going to go from Hebrew to hieroglyphics. He was going to be trained by some of the greatest thinkers of his time, mathematicians, leadership, linguists. You ever wonder why Moses gets to write the first five books of the New Te Old Testament? Old Testament? Because he knew how to write. You don't teach slaves how to write. Sons of Pharaoh's daughters learn how to write. And so we have the story of Genesis and the story of Exodus, that beautiful baby. That slave child would be adopted into a royal household. Church, that's who we are. We were slaves to sin, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are heirs of the promise. And that ought to be an amen, a car horn honk, whatever you want to do at this moment in that life, right? We were born slaves to sin, but we are heirs to a promise. I close with these three things. They're on your worksheet if you're following along with me. Hard times do not erase God's promises. Are you with me, church? Hard times do not erase God's promises. Yeah, we're in hard times, but we have hope. Harsh treatment does not escape God's notice. Are you with me? Harsh treatment does not escape God's notice. Yeah, he knows we are burdened right now. He knows some of you are anxious right now. He knows some of you are scared right now. It hasn't escaped his notice. And lastly, heavy tests, heavy tests don't eclipse God's concern. Yeah, we're going through a tough thing right now. And we may not be babies in a basket. We may have felt like we are some days. We may have felt like we were a basket case some days. But we are floating in a river, waiting to be delivered for a plan that God has for us. Well, that's going to be our adult Bible study for the next few weeks. It's going to be on Moses and the children of Israel. I hope you'll continue to follow that online as I put those videos on. But today I want to ask you, do you see the point? Do you see why Moses is important in these times? Some of you need to start with water today. Maybe we haven't talked a lot about baptism and all this. But some of you need to start with water today. Not to float in the water, but to be submerged in the water. To be raised to walk a new life. Not to be rescued by Pharaoh's daughter, but to be inheritors of a kingdom that's coming.